Coming up, a view from the crossroads of culture, nutrition, and food policy, a peek at the program of IFT First, and embracing the food as medicine movement. It's episode 38 of Omnivore, from the editors of Food Technology Magazine and the Institute of Food Technologists. This episode of Omnivore is brought to you by Almond Board of California. Almonds offer endless possibilities for innovation. Visit almonds.com slash trends to learn more. Welcome to Omnivore from IFT and Food Technology, where we explore the intersection of business, science, and technology in the global food system. I'm Bill McDowell. Nutritionist and public health advocate Tambra Ray Stevenson thinks of herself as a silo smasher. That's because her work is so interdisciplinary, set at the crossroads of health communication, food policy, and media technology. She spoke with Food Technology's Mary Ellen Kuhn about the importance of including cultural foods into diet recommendations, her passion for working with women to build community, and why we need a food bill of rights. Tambra, it's great to have you with us today on the Omnivore podcast. It was really interesting to me that you started out as a pre-med major, and now you're a really passionate advocate for the whole concept of food as medicine. So I guess in some ways, your career path has taken you full circle. Would you like to have the medical community think differently about the role that food can play in promoting health? You know, that is the key question that we're asking in the food as medicine movement. You know, what role can the medical community serve? And it's a great one. When we think about expanding the tools that one has at their disposal to truly serve patients and and the public at large, food is a critical tool in that range of tools, not just pharmaceutical. It it takes a multi, sometimes a multi-discipline approach to address these issues, because when you understand the true power of food, the power in it, how it shapes identity, how it shapes how we see ourselves and how it's an extension of who we are, that means our food should reflect our values as well. And if we value human health, then we should value the power of what food can do to us because it has the nourishment for our mind, body, and spirits. Amber, you have degrees in nutrition and health communication, and now you're working on a dissertation at American University on how technology can be used to promote public health. Tell us a little bit more about that. Most definitely. My research really was pivoted because of the pandemic. Initially, when I came into the program, I was looking at doing gains for health research. That's what I saw my kids on devices. And I thought, how can these tools of technology be used for good, used for our health? And you saw a surge of gamers during the pandemic, even did research around it and how they use it to create community and and whether through social isolation But the other part that I started to also notice is communities on the different social media platforms be formed around health and and finding information and building resources and supporting one another. And I became really inquisitive about the idea of how these online communities not only improve health, but how does that sense of belonging play a role in that, especially for women, um, women who look like me even, and how can organizations learn to better use these social media platforms to build communities in a way that creates the, not only the change of health behavior, but creates that sense of community that we saw a critical part of our healing journey in the midst of the pandemic. And so that became the the foundation of my work of looking at sense of belonging and understanding that in the whole scheme of Maslow's hierarchy of need, belonging was just as critically important as food. Well, I wanted to take the opportunity while we were talking today to learn a little bit more about your organization, WANDA, which stands for Women Advancing Nutrition, Dietetics, and Agriculture. Well, could you tell us a little bit about how you're bringing the nutritional component into WANDA in terms of promoting eating nutritiously and making good choices? So we do it in a few ways. So the mission of Wanda is to build a pipeline and platform for women and girls of African descent to be the food heroes that our community needs from farm to health through education, advocacy, and innovation. And so in the area of education that has come in the form of our Wanda books, 
sharing the nutritional value of local African foods from millet to hibiscus and a range of other diverse diasporan foods, as well as <clears throat> through our academy, providing a dietitian who's reflective of the community to help provide that cultural culinary nutrition education to help women remix their recipes for their health uh, versus just giving them recipes because understanding from an education perspective, when learning by doing is the most effective way that I've seen for people to change behavior. And what's the best way by taking your own family recipes and you being the food shero in your own family to create those recipes of resiliency and restoration, respectability of, of what your ancestors ate, but also how do you sustain life by making a few tweaks to them as well and remixing them. Well, thank you. Before we wrap up, I wanted to ask you just to reflect on your own career. You're, you're a mom, you're an educator, you're an advocate pursuing your PhD. Um, what accomplishment in your career brings you the greatest satisfaction so far? I think right now championing this, the concept of food democracy. A couple years back with Food Tank, we released an article about the Food Bill of Rights. And in it, we released a study, launched a study called the Food Democracy Study that garnered more than a thousand respondents, majority saying at least 90% that we need a Food Bill of Rights in this country. And it's deplorable to know that, you know, in the richest nation, we still have too many people not only being food insecure, but nutrition insecure and understanding that it's not just about access to food, we need access to healthy, affordable, cultural foods that affirm who we are and also extend life and build our local food economies to make a more secure nation and a more secure economy for all to participate in. And so that's why I'm working on a food citizen's guide and championing for a food bill of rights and, and understanding that, you know, if we don't get anything passed this year with this farm bill, this issue will forever be here because we're always going to need food as Maslow's hierarchy of needs speaks of. And it's one that we're always going to need to champion. So we need to codify, legalize this idea of right to food and how it's connected to right to health. And when we think about th those two concepts, that should be the foundation of what makes a nation great is their ability to heal and our ability to nourish a nation together. So is that Food Bill of Rights something that would be specific legislation? Yes, we believe that one, when you have a Food Bill of Rights at the state or local level, as well as national level, one, it provides a framework to address nutrition security. The other part is it helps to provide not a framework for our food policy councils that many states have, some do not. And so if you have a state or a city like Oklahoma City, Dallas, as an example, where we gather women doing sisterhood suppers and use these moments of building tables, but opportunities to how do we sh shake tables is understanding that you need a pathway to channel your grievances in a democracy. And right now, if you don't have a food policy council, how do you channel that? And you need representatives who care about food, who understand the importance of food. And so at a time where we have the most elections around the world and the most elections happening here in the U.S., the number of House Senate seats are being up for grabs. And so candidates should be asked the question about where do they stand on a food bill of rights? It can be in form of a resolution as a first starter. Then it can be elevated up to another level in terms of a bill that can support and inform existing pieces of legislation that's already on the books and new legislation that needs to be formed. But when you think about the fight around SNAP and other existing pieces of legislation, the Food Bill of Rights would be that umbrella framework that would bring all those pieces together. And right now we've had a very silo kind of approach of addressing food issues in the country. And if we take a more public health approach, an interdisciplinary approach, it brings all of these issues under one framework to understand that our food system is connected from farm to health, not farm only, not health only. And the way everything is structured with an ag committee uh, separate from the health community, which is the health component, 
we have a fragmented Congress to represent a fragmented system to understanding that food and health should be connected. We should have a White House National Nutrition Security Council to help build that framework of understanding if we had a czar, a food czar that connected all the food that crosses over 50 different federal agencies, we would have a more coordinated system like our national security system. Well, thank you for that explanation. And it's clear you have a vision. Thanks for sharing it with us today. Thank you so much. And people can learn more about it at foodbillofrights.org, which we launched at the National Food Policy Conference this year. Tamara Ray Stevenson is a public health advocate and the founder and CEO of WANDA, Women Advancing Nutrition, Dietetics, and Agriculture. Learn more about her belief in food as a healing agent of change in the June issue of Food Technology. We'll be back with more Omnivore in a moment. But first, this word from our sponsor. This episode of Omnivore is brought to you by Almond Board of California. Almonds offer endless possibilities for innovation. To help you stay ahead of the curve, Almond Board partnered with TasteWise, a generative AI platform for modern food and beverage brands to identify shifts that will help shape the future of snacking and beyond. Get inspired and learn more by visiting almonds.com slash trends. Again, that's visiting almonds.com slash trends. Welcome back to Omnivore. I'm Bill McDowell. The program at this year's IFT First annual event and expo at Chicago's McCormick Place next month sets the stage for transformative innovation and science in action. This year's theme is collaboration and innovation. How can food science and technology transform the food system? Professionals from across the science of food will gather to study and share practical market-based innovations and creative scientific applications that could make a difference in the global food system. Food Technologies Emily Little spoke with Jacqueline Beckley, this year's chair of IFT's annual meeting Scientific Programs Advisory Panel, about what's new and exciting on this year's agenda. Jacqueline, I am so excited to talk about this year's annual event. I am too. It's getting close, isn't it? So close. Just two more flips of the calendar. Yeah. So to start off, could you tell me one favorite memory that you have of IFT First? I only get one. (laughs) I, I think IFT First has been held for many of the IFT First at McCormick Place. And it's always very exciting to walk in and to see all of the banners in the lobby of McCormick Place and just to see that enormous group, scientists and IFT members who have decided to come to Chicago in the middle of July to see other scientists to pick up information, to go to the expo floor. So I've got to say that that's just a long-term memory of the excitement to see both new and also old friends at these events. It's very exciting. And there's so many people. Yes. I think, you know, we talk about this as staff that you don't understand the scale of it until you're there. And my first time going to IFT first, I think I just stood in awe for a good few minutes. But here's the secret. Even though there's a lot of people, the field, you know, food is so important. But the field of food science and the science of food is actually very small. So it's kind of like if I find one person, I say, do you know X, Y, Z? They may not, but a friend of theirs probably will. So it's such a close community. We all kind of know each other, Mm -hmm. even if we're not very good friends, and even if we didn't go to the same schools. So it's very exciting. Tell me about some of the new programming at this year's event. I know we have the 15-minute individual presentations. We're bringing back the scientific and technical forums. Tell me a bit about what attendees can expect. 
Well, in what I'm doing as part of the scientific and technical program, members indicated that they wanted an opportunity to give individual presentations. So during the call for speakers for the forums or for individual presentations, we had an enormous array of people suggesting talks they'd like to give. So, for example, over the course of the two days that we're going to be having the scientific program, which is Monday, I believe the 15th, is it? Yes, Monday the 15th and Tuesday the 16th of July, we will have individual speakers who are going to present topics that dovetail with the program, along with numerous forums, which are 75 minutes in length. And the speakers have about 15 minutes along with about three minutes of Q&A for the individuals. So we've got a lot of programming going on. It happens, sadly, a lot of it happens at the same time. And also what is new this year is some of the forums are going to be on the main stage. So they're going to be able, rather than being in the rooms that I believe are upstairs above the expo floor, they'll be in the um, main stage. So that's a, a new thing too, where we're highlighting some of our presentations. Is there one specific forum or topic that you're most looking forward to? Well, ultra processed foods has been uh, a big topic. And so there's going to be a session on Monday afternoon on the main stage. So I'm looking forward to seeing how that comes out. But it is in competition with individual topics and also other forums. So yeah, I'm excited about seeing how the ultra processed food comes about. So let's talk about the expo floor. That's where a lot of people spend time. We've been calling it this global marketplace. Tell me about what attendees can expect when they actually set foot on the show floor. Uh, they're going to see a huge range of vendors who have brought the newest technologies They've got their technical teams, they've got their marketing teams, they've got their sales teams. They're all ready to help educate about what they're thinking about in the science of food. So it's a tremendous opportunity to see what's offered. And many of those individuals ought to give some more science-oriented presentations at Business First. So that's also a nice opportunity to get some education. If you're less interested in deep science and maybe more interested in applied science. Well, Jacqueline, thank you so much for talking about this year's event and I will see you in July. Jacqueline Beckley is a principal at the Understanding and Insight Group and the 2024 chair of IFT's Annual Meeting Scientific Programs Advisory Panel. There's still time to register for IFT First. Just head to iftevent.org to learn more about program details and what to expect at this year's Innovation Expo. Whether you refer to it as food is medicine or food as medicine, this concept has been getting a lot of attention lately. While the idea that the food we eat impacts our health might seem obvious, the direct connection between food and healthcare has often gone unnoticed or avoided entirely. Many organizations across both the public and private spectrum are working to change that. Instacart Health is one of them. Started in 2022 by the grocery technology company Instacart, the initiative aims to advance the food as medicine movement through partnerships, research, and policy advocacy. Food Technology Magazine's Deputy Managing Editor, Kelly Hensel, recently chatted with Beatrice Abiero, Policy Research Senior Manager at Instacart, about the company's efforts to advance the movement. 
Well, thank you for joining me today, Dr. Abiero. I really appreciate the chance to talk to you more about Instacart Health and the food as medicine kind of movement. And to start out, I wanted to ask you, I've been hearing a lot about food as medicine or food is medicine lately, and it seems like in a lot of news outlets, it's getting a lot of attention. And I was wondering what it means for you. What does that phrase mean for you? For me, I hear this phrase often as well. And what food as medicine means to me is a movement about embracing the power of food to improve health outcomes. And I had to step back to think about like what movements are to begin with. And when we think about movements, we think about an effort to challenge and change how we as a society think about an issue. And in the food as medicine movement, the push is to think about the role that food plays in our health. And the underlying notion really isn't new. We've heard phrases like you are what you eat. But over the past few years, what we've seen is that this momentum and movement accelerate as more physicians, researchers, and academics in the United States and around the world embrace the idea that nutritious food can help promote long-term wellness and potentially treat or prevent illnesses. My background is in public health and being at Instacart, for me, was an opportunity to go back to my public health roots because food is inherently a social determinant of health. And at Instacart, we recognize that many of the biggest health problems are really food problems. There are two stats um, that are really staggering. The first is that more than one in 10 people in America don't have reliable access to nutritious food. And more than 100 million people in the United States suffer from diet-related disease. And this subsequently impacts healthcare costs, where we see that 85% of our healthcare costs come from treating chronic diet-related diseases. And at Instacart, we believe in the power of food to improve health outcomes. And guided by our CEO, PG Simo's vision, we believe that we can help more closely integrate food and nutrition in our healthcare system. I was really surprised in a good way to hear that Instacart was getting involved in this kind of movement. It's really nice to see such a big company that has such wide reach getting involved on the ground level. I was thinking about this as a movement as well. And I was thinking, you know, there was a lot of movement around like making things carbon neutral. There's a lot of things about your carbon footprint. And, you know, it tended to be overused or, or used by marketing in, in a bad way, I guess. And it ended up being kind of greenwashed. And I was wondering if there's any fear, maybe it's not warranted, um, of something similar happening to the phrase food as medicine. That's a great question. And I think a legitimate concern. But for me, I'm not, not concerned about the overuse of the phrase. And that's because we're actually talking about food for the first time in a different way than we have in, in some time. And I actually think that it's useful to have this phrasing because it helps us rally around issues around food, raising awareness and its importance that it could play when it comes to nutrition and health. And one thing that I've observed uh, being in meetings, talking to other stakeholders within the food space and observing just what's happening within the, the literature is that there's intentionality behind understanding the role food can play in our health and with this phrasing. But there, there is one thing that I think is important to be mindful of as part of this discussion, and that is the personal connection that people have with food. It can bring up lots of things for people, right? But I think it's really important for the decision makers and the stakeholders that are part of the discussion to be mindful of the personal connection that people have with food and, and ways to support individuals on the journey, wherever they are within their food journey. And so I'm not concerned with the overuse of this phrase. I'm glad that it is becoming a more mainstream part of conversation. So then it's at the core of how we think about the role that food plays in our, in our healthcare and for promoting our wellness. Interesting. I love the, the use of your word intentionality because that really makes all the difference, right? Being intentional in how we use it and how we as a society from you know healthcare pr practitioners down to food manufacturers are, are working with it. I know that you, a, a big benefit of Instacart as, as, a, as an organization is that you guys have a big reach and you have lots of partnerships. And I know you talked about some of them in, in the dialogue article that you wrote. What other partnerships that you guys are either working on or starting are you particularly excited about? At Instacart, specifically sitting on the research side, we have some exciting partnerships underway. I'll highlight three research partnerships. One with the University of Kentucky Food is Health Alliance, and the second is with the no, is with two entities, No Kid Hungry by Share of Strength and Mercy Housing. And the last one was with the Journal of Healthcare for the Poor and Underserved in Meharry Medical College. 
With the first study that I mentioned, we're partnering with UKY to conduct a food prescription study for two target populations, individuals with gestational diabetes and individuals with hypertension or type 2 diabetes. The goal of this study is to provide nutrition education to participants, empower them in order to then choose groceries that really align with what connects to them, and then ultimately improve health outcomes. Um, another key aspect of the study is to understand how to drive cost efficiencies for food as medicine programs, particularly in rural communities in Kentucky. What the researchers value too is that for traditional food prescription programs, typically participants are given like a, a food box, like where they don't have a choice of what goes into it. But when they're using a product like Fresh Funds, where participants receive the education, have a, a tool set to refer to and to understand what they could shop for, they really are able to tap into that dignity of choice to then choose what's relevant to them, meeting them where they are, and then being able to support their ongoing journey, whether it's with gestational diabetes or hypertension. For the second study, we're working with No Kid Hungry and Mercy Housing. These are two nonprofit organizations to expand access to nutrition, to nutritious food and nutrition education, kind of similar to um, the University of Kentucky Partnership, but specifically for families who are in affordable housing communities in food deserts, which are really low income, low access areas. And so through this partnership, 200 families living in affordable housing communities in California and Georgia will receive ongoing nutrition guidance and support from No Kid Hungry, as well as Instacart Plus memberships. What this allows is a free delivery on orders that are $35 or more and monthly Instacart Health Fresh Funds grocery stipends for a full year. This study is still ongoing, and so we're anticipating being able to learn more about results in the coming months. And then the final partnership that I'd mentioned involves the Journal of Healthcare for the Point Underserved, which was founded at a historically Black college university, Meharry Medical College. And what we're doing, this is a first at Instacart. We're producing a supplemental issue on research related to food access. And so the journal typically publishes different issues each month, but for the November 2024 issue, this issue will be in partnership with Instacart and, and focus on food as medicine research, innovations in that space, especially for individuals in historically marginalized communities. So it, when research studies that have highlighted those communities, they'll be included as part of the supplemental issue. And so these three different research partnerships are underway. We have others that are ongoing and, and under discussion. We're excited to share results over the coming months to help inform the food as medicine initiatives. That's wonderful. I was just thinking that the University of Kentucky one, I actually had gestational diabetes and I have access to, you know, I'm lucky enough to have access to a great healthcare team. And I still had questions about what I should be eating, what I shouldn't be eating. So I think it's, it's, it's an amazing idea to like really obviously tie in food and healthcare more closely. Um, it's definitely needed everywhere. Instacart Health launched very recently, 2022. So it's still very early stages, but I was wondering if you could give me, give us the listeners a, a taste of like what kind of outcomes you would like to see in the next five to 10 years. In the next five to 10 years, I think there's an opportunity to focus on improving access. Ultimately, this work is about ensuring that every person in every community can access the nutritious food they need to live a healthy and fulfilling life. As I mentioned earlier, one in 10 Americans doesn't have reliable access to nutritious food. And so I think for the next five to 10 years, there's a real opportunity for public and private sector partners to help bridge this gap. And secondly, we hope to see food and nutrition continue to be integrated more widely into healthcare. And so what this means from my perspective is that it starts with ensuring that food as medicine is a big part of the healthcare conversation and ultimately it means more healthcare providers and insurers are building food programs into their approach to care and thinking about nutrition as a key tool to promoting wellness. Yeah, I think it's it's really exciting what Instacart is doing, and I, I can't wait to see some more of these results come out. So thank you so much, Dr. Abiero, for coming on the show today, and I really appreciate your input. Beatrice Abiero is Policy Research Senior Manager at Instacart and a member of the Bipartisan Policy Center's Food as Medicine Working Group. You can read more of Dr. Abiero's thoughts on the Food as Medicine movement in the June issue of Food Technology. 
Thank you to this episode's sponsor, Almond Board of California. Get inspired and learn more by visiting almonds.com slash trends. And that wraps up this episode of Omnivore. Thanks again to all our guests and my colleagues at Food Technology. Omnivore is produced and distributed by the Institute of Food Technologists. If you enjoyed today's show and want to learn more about Food Technology Magazine or how to join the conversation by becoming an IFT member, visit ift.org slash membership. For more in-depth discussion about innovation in the science of food, Check out IFT's other podcast, SciDish, on the news and publications page of IFT.org. If you have comments or suggestions for future shows, just send us an email. The address is editors at IFT.org. For the entire team at Food Technology and IFT, I'm Bill McDowell. Thanks for listening, and join us again for our next episode. This is Omnivore.